we have 2,968 blog posts. Wow. 2,968 blog posts, which normally uh, for folks who are listening in, you're probably like, oh, you're going to do something special for 3,000. No, what I'm probably going to do is immediately after this podcast or webcast, go back and look at some of the older posts and start deleting things out, things that really shouldn't be there anymore. You know, that <laughs> I was working on my happen. laptop in Linux. That's what I would do. I would just delete half of them randomly because we don't want unlucky blog posts on there. Oh. Well, I could start with Richie's, but that's only like three. <laughs> four. I think I get four. I think four, four, man. Look at that. Tara's smoking you in the blog department. Tara is smoking yeah, right. you. <laughs> yes, but I, I, have, I am dominating her in unit tests. Just dominating. She's, but she's winning two out of three. She's also got you on stack reputation. So, like I, like I, <laughs> just, <laughs> good. go for it. Richie has been a member of Stack Overflow for what was it, eight years and eight months since the beta. When the beta, such a few days after they went live with the beta, that was insane. Hey, how did you find out about it through Jeff's blog or? Mm -hmm. Yep. Wow. Wow, look at you. Yep, and, and, and you know, early on, I, I, I was, you know, sneaking through it and looking for a few stuff, ask a few things, but I just don't have that many questions to ask, and I've got kids and stuff going on, and I'm just, John Ski beats me to all the answers, so there you go. Beats everyone. Tara, you are beating up on that keyboard like... <laughs> wow. I'm replying to somebody's question. Yeah. Um, in the, you should the answer that out loud because this is interesting. I saw okay. this. <laughs> so this is, you're talking, so somebody's asking... You don't get stack department. reputation for these, these answers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Take us on these, too. Somebody was asking in the questions which department I worked for in San Diego, and he's saying that he worked at Animal Services when I was there. Um, and his name is um, Ron, and I, um, Ron actually helped me <laughs> through a major um, restore that we had to do. It wasn't SQL Server, Centura SQL Base, but Ron at that point ha was working for the vendor of, uh, of the um, animal control software that, that we were using, and the back end at the time was Centura SQL Base. So Ron used to be the DBA, but then he went, went to go work for the, the vendor instead. And we had a major, major outage. Um, there was some kind of limitation in that version of Centura SQL Base that... I think once a database, I think once it hit two gigabytes, it stopped working, something like that. Um, and we had to um, like reorganize it every few weeks to get it back down to a reasonable size. You'd export it all and then import it back in as um, using insert statements. And we ended up hitting the two gigabyte limitation. Maybe it's four gigabyte. I don't remember. And yeah, you know, the whole thing was just down. And we ended up having to uh, recover from. Gosh, this was like a um, a Novell server or something like that, where the backups were. This is going back so many years. <laughs> um, this was back in like 2000, probably in like 2002. Oh no, before that, 2000, 2001. <laughs> Using token ring, it was on a token ring. It was, it was, it was a nightmare. We ended up going home at like I don't know two in the morning, and we were told, um, this is before we got Ron involved, and we were told to arrive back at back at the office at six a.m. to start troubleshooting. So we've been working like all night. So we got like I had like I had like a half an hour commute to get home and back and stuff, and so I got like two hours of sleep and back in at six a.m. and Ron, um, you know, he he's, he was local to San Diego, and so we got a hold of his um, employer, the vendor of the software package, and um, he had, I think he showed up at our offices around 8 a.m., and it took hours to get this um, data, this mission-critical database back online. <laughs> it was oh. it was a nightmare. So, Ron, I was Tara Duggan at the time. I wasn't married. Um, so, yeah, you sat in my, in my cubicle at the um, CSC um, cubicle farm for several hours one day. So I definitely remember you and your name. <laughs> wow. So how long did mm -hmm. it take to move two gigs over your TAC line? <laughs> Did the punch cards were they out of order at any given point? Yeah. Yeah, dual fifty six k modems. I still have um, Centura SQL Base on my resume. Maybe I'm not sure. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was fun times back then. I actually liked Centura SQL Base better than SQL Server back then. Um, it, it was more configurable um, back then. You know, we're talking about a lot of years ago. Mm -hmm. So this is before 2005 was released when it really became an enterprise product. Ooh. Ron says I know that that, I know that, that database got upgraded to SQL Server. Um, I, I was part of the project, but then I ended up leaving that company, and so that happened after I left. 
Well, you know, we got a, a bunch of uh, questions in here already. We might as well go ahead and get started. We're a little early, but why not? You people have good questions in here. So this is an interesting one. Roland asks, how can I be sure of no negative effects when I'm deleting an unused index? Is there any way that the optimizer is using those stats for a better plan but not using the index itself? The only way to do that is to test, man. There's not a better way. You know, because like, uh, this is something that I think I think I talked about in a blog post, but I can't remember. I don't know if it's I don't know if it's out yet. Uh, so this is like you know when when you're when you're when you're adding or removing indexes or whatever you're doing with indexes, uh, people always focus on the one query that they're working with. So if they're adding a missing index, they're like, oh, it makes this query better, but they never like sort of regression test other queries or you know other things that go on on the server as well. So really, the only way to do it is to uh, know your workload, try to know your queries. I'm not asking you to know every single index they use, but try to know your kind of which queries run on average. And you know, when you go to add or remove indexes, make sure that you can kind of replicate your uh, your, your normal workload to see if there's any regressions within it. Which is hard, but that's why you get paid a lot of money. Kyle. <laughs> Kyle says, "Can you stand just one more compatibility level question?" He says, I'm asking about compatibility levels between databases on the same server. I had a query that went totally wonky when it queried across databases. One of my databases was 2012 compat, the other was 2016. So could that influence, could you get different query plans for having databases in two different compat levels? Yeah. Cardinality estimator is different. You can have the same query run in three different databases as long as you fully prefix your objects with like uh, select star from stack overflow dot dbo dot posts. You can run that in several different databases and get several different query plans. You, Kyle mentioned that you're on 2016. It gets even worse. 2016 have, has database level settings like uh, MaxDop too, and that can give you different query plans per database that you're in. Well, the, I mean, there's a there's a uh, forced parameterization at the uh database level oh, to it. Yeah. Oh, that's good. <clears throat> Paul says, we often lose our SPN for SQL servers and then they need to be rebuilt. Oh dear God, no, you don't have to do that. Uh, where should I start looking for SPN problems and is this a common problem? It is a common problem. It's actually one that I fixed. Haha. <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> well, you know, it, it feels like I fixed it. So, uh, for, for your for your service account user, uh, the thing that worked, the thing that did the trick for me, not having to rebuild them, was to uh, give it permission to delegate uh, Kerberos authentication or one of those. Uh, and that's what that's what always worked for me. It would, it, when I restarted SQL, would be able to re, would re get the SPN without a problem. Eric says, not that Eric, but he does spell as Eric the same way. Uh, says he had a colleague mention that he wanted to have an active active AG love this question already uh, so that we could make use of unused resources basically one node handling a database and another node handling the other databases and then synchronizes them across I have an inclination that this is something I want to avoid any help would be appreciated I don't know if he wa if he wants help with so uh, what's the question in here should I Will I, nil I? Tara, take I it away. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. I mean, you're going to need to license both servers. You need two availability groups since you're going to be um, writing on one node and then writing in a different database on another on another node. Um, you may want to have a third a third node um, just in case. You know, if if one node can't handle the load of both databases, if you lose a node, um, a third node would be um, recommended for a um, a scenario like this where two nodes are active. You want to have a passive node in this scenario. What would make you choose always on availability groups over failover clustering if you had the choice between those? Is there anything that would make you choose one way or the other? For me, I mean, it, I like failover clustering, but it, we also had um, disaster recovery requirements, so we had to pair that with you know database mirroring. So availability groups, you know, we were able to get rid of FCIs and database mirroring and just use one technology. So that, you know. Just using one technology is was my was my goal, and plus we got to get rid of replication for you know read-only reports. So got to get rid of three three um, three things for just one feature. Plus we fired that guy we never really liked. 
uh, <laughs> JH says, what's the easiest way to capture DML stuff, inserts, updates, and deletes, for a specific table? He heard that change tracking and change data capture doesn't track things like username, T-SQL statements, date and time, and host and IP address. Wow, you want to capture a lot of stuff for a specific table. Uh, have you guys ever tried to audit username, host name, uh, IP address, and all that for inserts, updates, and deletes? Not I. I mean, the performance overhead on this kind of stuff is just not worth it usually. What, why are you trying to audit this stuff? Oh, that's a good. Oh, that he has a follow-up question. This is, uh, boy, this really makes it interesting. He says it's in dev, and there aren't too many DMLs, so I'm not really concerned about performance. Would triggers be good or something better or easier? It's in dev. I have an easy way to do that. You restore the database every day. Every day you restore from production. And then anybody who's complaining about their inserts, updates, and deletes, whoever starts complaining that their data is lost, that's how you find <laughs> out who did it. Development yeah, I mean, is not no. where you keep your data. No, I would. I, you know, if this were if it were production, I, I, for that granularity, I would go with a third-party tool. I would want someone who already has it figured out. Rolling your own for that's a pain in the butt. And for, for, for a dev environment, I might even just use a server-side trace and just, you know, it, not much oh. activity is occurring there. Just go ahead and trace yeah. it. Yeah, it's easy to do. I, every now and then I meet DBAs who are like, oh, I want to control everything with an iron fist and not let my developers do anything. I'm like, no, what, you know, let them go put data in because they're trying to do test cases, and I know Richie puts garbage data in the database all the time. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure he puts any Brent other kind sucks. of data. Brent sucks. Brent sucks a lot. <laughs> we don't like Brent. <laughs> <laughs> you don't actually read the dev database, so it, I can put whatever I want. Yeah, then it becomes production. Next thing you know, wait a minute, our website, I'm talking about it. <laughs> Let's see. Nestor says, did you guys ever experience performance problems that were due to disk fragmentation, a.k.a. the hard drive? I would never know because I don't ever worry about disk, disk fragmentation. <laughs> so how would I even know if I'm experiencing performance problems because of it? I just, you know, I don't worry about it. And why yeah, don't you, know, you worry I, about it? Oh, no, good. Is it a problem? I don't know. I mean, who, who can defragment their disks? You know, who, who's got the downtime yeah. to do that? I, I, you know, I've always supported 24, 24 by 7 systems that have, you know, really high SLAs. And you know that you can run into you can run into some bad problems too. Like you know if you're on, if you're on a SAN and you're thin provisioned and you run disk defragmenter, all of a sudden you are very thickly provisioned mm. in some situations. The last time you know the last time I defragmented a di disk and it did something, it was like Windows 95 and it made Riven. Like, <laughs> yes. that much yeah. faster. like the fog looked a little bit better in Riven after I defragmented my disk. I think, but that might have been the restart. Ima I don't know. Images came up just a little bit faster, right? <laughs> okay. And don't you think that Back in those days, I mean, the, the display of the disk defragmenter thing in Windows, that was the big reason to run it. It was really cool. <laughs> it looked the little box awesome. changing colors was nice. Yeah. Like, and like all the, all the, like, uh, like, uh, computer fixing suites had, like, their own defragmenter. Mm -hmm. I remember, like, Norton had one and, the, like, McAfee had one. They'd all do something different. Ah. Oh. The good old days. Fragmentation has been a Windows lie for mm -hmm. decades. I wonder if the only the only time to worry about disk fragmentation is when you're encountering an issue with sparse files. Does, doesn't when you have the sparse file issue with CheckDB, isn't that compounded by the d disk fragmentation? Yeah. I mean, there's a workaround for that, but that's the only thing I can think of. Yeah, and fixing it, when you talk about fixing it, if you're really fixed or fragmented that bad that CheckDB won't run, then you're really talking about restoring over to another SQL server if you want to minimize downtime, do log shipping or database mirroring over somewhere else. Who wants to do that? That's a hell of a way to fix fragmentation. Yeah, plus you're probably on some ancient, awful server with, like, misaligned disks and whatever. <laughs> you probably have, like, two, Windows 2003 or something. Yeah. Uh, Eric says, I have a follow-up to the active-active availability group question. He said he would rather just leave both of these databases on the primary and not have to split them up across nodes. My real question is, are there any benefits across splitting these databases onto separate nodes, or would the performance be the same if they were all on the same node? No, I mean Eric, the performance I is different. <laughs> if an instance runs on one and another instance runs on the other node, you're, you're using separate hardware. So I mean, yeah, the um, all your DML is you know if it's synchronous, it's all a you know, two-phase commit. But you know, it's got different um, you know plan cache, different um, buffer pool. Um, you know, you're utilizing the hardware of two servers. Buffer pool is a great point. Yeah. 
William says, what kinds of problems would you encounter if you enabled both RCSI and the simple recovery model? We'd like to point out that he used the word model. <laughs> Yay! Is, <laughs> hot button. Uh, yeah, wow, that's an interesting question. I don't see how they're necessarily related. I mean, RCSI doesn't really care. Your um, snapshots are being stored in TempDB's version store. So I don't see how, yeah, I don't see how the, the, the you know, full recovery, simple recovery model, who, who, who cares? If you have a long-running transaction, a begin tran, it doesn't matter whether you're in simple or full recovery or whether you have RCSI turned on. That, that log file is going to grow. Victor says, we had high CPU usage on a SQL server. I don't think it was actually the SQL server <laughs> service, but it's post-mortem. How can I rule out the SQL server was the problem to my manager? What kind of monitoring did you have in place to have collected the data? You know, did you have who is active collecting data, you know, every minute or something like that? So, you know, what kind of monitoring do you have in place? You know, there's, if you don't have anything in place, there's, you, know, you can't answer this. I feel like an idiot for not thinking about that. I was just like immediately like, well, you can't. But well, and the other thing, if you have, if you caught it within four hours, CPU usage is in the ring buffer, That's and there's true. this weird. But it's I mean I'm sure you didn't wait for office hours, and you know it didn't just happen two hours ago. But uh, let's see here. Doug says I've been using Resource Governor to prevent poorly written queries from specific reporting servers from taking down entire SQL instance. Is that the proper use for Resource Governor, or is there a better way to fix this? Hmm. I get worried about slowing down problematic queries because now they're going to be running longer and you know taking out locks for longer, it caught me up, wrecking possibly wrecking more havoc because they're running longer. Yeah, I mean, I guess if if your only concern is that they don't take over the server, then that's a, probably a pretty valid use for it. But you know, I would I would I would expect repercussions at some point. Often the, the thing people complain about is uh, hammering the disks too, and it didn't control I.O. until 2016, so mm -hmm. if it was written really poorly, it was still just hammering the disks. Philip says, does a replication snapshot try to rebuild indexes online? Philip, I don't even know, recognize <laughs> the words in your question. In the, <laughs> says, I, I'll have to... It's a long question. Now you have me intrigued. Normally, uh, Philip, I would have stopped here, but he says, I ask because we get application disconnections during a replication snapshot with 2012 Standard Edition. Aha. Uh, I would want Enterprise, but not my choice, and it wouldn't matter because I could re-index online. I think it might be re-indexing because of a message about re-indexing I saw pop up on the replication monitor while it was processing the snapshot. You're talking about... Um, the it has to create the indexes if you've told it to on the um, subscriber. So it, it's not re-indexing the publisher database. The, the only the only effect that um, takes place on the publisher, um, as far as you know, something bad is when it has to do um, the, the schema locks towards the end. And so the, you could experience some downtime depending upon how sensitive your application is um, while at the very end of that snapshot process when it does that. Or maybe it's during the entire snapshot process, but you know, the snapshot usually is pretty fast, even on a large database. It's 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 you know applying that snapshot on the subscriber that takes a while. I would probably just want to stop doing index maintenance and see if you still get the same messages. Oh, that's true too. I would just I would just stop doing it, and if your if your snapshots work, then. I thought yeah, you were going to say stop doing replication, but I'm like, hey, yeah, okay. that too. <laughs> I would stop doing both in a perfect world, but if you have to do one, of the, if one's breaking the other, then you stop doing one, and if the other one works, then cool. Oh, Nick, I like Nick's question. Nick says, how do I go about getting metrics on linked server usage and performance? Someone set one up without my consent, and now I need some data to back up my reason to launch them into the sun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I would look that's at the, the wait stats and look for the OLADB uh, wait stat, and if that's really high up in the list and it's, there's a lot of waiting time on it, you know, link servers are usually the culprit of OLADB, but you need to figure out what queries are running. So Blitzcache will actually warn you if you have expensive remote queries in it. Uh, I wrote that one. So that's the only reason I know. If Jeremiah had written it, I would have no idea. But uh, it, it'll it'll check your plan cache, and if you have, I forget what the, all the rules are, but it's like if a if you have an expensive remote query or an expensive remote query operator in your in your execution plan, it'll throw up a warning about that. 
See, I question his decision to launch him into the sun. You see, that, that that seems expensive, right? So, I mean, you got to get that person all the way out of the atmosphere and then breaking the gravity of the Earth and into the sun. And besides, nobody can see them at that point. They're burned up. So I think maybe stringing them up on somewhere where everybody can see the what happens when you do something stupid, I think that may be a better uh, better use of your uh, your time and your money. I mean, really, all you need is Aquanet and a lighter. <laughs> you can save yourself a whole lot of rocket fuel. I was just mm. thinking duct tape and a flagpole, but okay, man. I mean, whatever. <laughs> Here, ladies and gentlemen, you can see the difference between New York justice and Miami <laughs> justice, <laughs> visually. Anna asks, is always on recommended in virtual machines? Sure. Recommended or supported? <laughs> Yeah. By well, sure, yeah. <laughs> so I support it in both. You know, and what do you mean by always on? We're talking about availability groups, but either way, availability groups or available cluster instance, yes, virtual or physical. <laughs> Here comes Alan Hurt. <laughs> <laughs> the, always, the always on part drives me crazy. <laughs> I don't care about the space, you know, the capitalization, yeah. things like that. <laughs> you should always say. Always just a marketing term. And, what's, so, and what does it refer to? Because there's a couple of differences there. I mean, usually people are trying to refer to availability groups, but always on also um, has developer cluster instances underneath it. Just like the word snapshot, there's like half a dozen uses for it. John asks, is it possible to mark a table as read-only as opposed to marking an entire database as read-only? No, but you could make it so that, only, that no users can actually do anything to it. No, you can do better than that. Really? What would yes. you do? Put in its own uh, file group and mark it read only. Yes. Is that what it is? Yes. Uh, Can you mark a file group read only in SQL Server, or is you doing it? Are you doing it at the file level? Yeah. Yeah, okay. you mark the whole file group read only. Yeah, that's and it's elegant. Users have no idea that anything changed. They're just inserts, updates, and deletes fail. Nothing <laughs> <laughs> changed, though. <so. laughs> Amy says, "I oh my god, Amy, that's like three paragraphs long. Go ahead and uh, ask that one over on Stack." Uh, Roland says, are there resources on how multiple independent updates on a table are aggregated into... Oh, let me hold on a second here, Roland. Let me take a deep breath. Are there, some, are there some resources on how multiple independent updates on a table are aggregated into one transaction by an indexed view being replicated to another server? The hell are you asking, Roland? Uh there are some questions. Oh, he says, in a follow-up, he says, I think that my updates are being split into deletes and inserts. That's true, replication, um, but it doesn't have yeah. to be. That's just by default. It, um, updates do get um, switched to delete and insert, but there is a setting where you can change it to, to be updates. Are you is kidding it, me? Is it no. or a trace flag? I don't remember. Yeah, yeah I'm always think it's a trace flag. The delete inserts. Yeah, change data capture actually does the same thing when you update it, it shows as an uh, or when you uh, update it, it shows an insert it's inserted and delete. But I, I'm not sure if that's for every update because I know that like behind the scenes the optimizer will make a choice to either do a simple update or an insert and delete combo. There's like the whole split sort collapse chain of operators in, a, in an execution plan. So I don't know if it's every single one, but for the ones that do do that, it's kind of annoying. I think between uh, our, uh, all of us working in the chat room, in our company chat room, I learn something sad about SQL Server every day. <laughs> I mean, many days I'm also happy I learn cool things, but most days I learn something sad too. That's my sad thing for the today. <laughs> Justin says, my Windows team, they do our SQL backups. This sounds like the beginning of a poem. They want to put all of our high I.O. databases onto a single drive and their logs on a separate drive. Would this be bad for performance? Right now we have multiple drives and our databases are spread out by I.O. What, so, what are they trying to solve, though? Yeah, yeah. I like that question. I wonder if they're trying to do like snapshot backups or a specific stand vendor snapshot backups and makes the data and logs be on different drives. Uh, Justin says, our backup software has issues. Oh, yes. 
Um, fix, the, fix the backup software. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I will or switch to native SQL Server backups. I mean, it's just so much easier. Write to a file share and then back up that file share. Say, do you like Bill Clinton? I feel your pain. Let's get together and fix your pain. Uh, Guillermo says, after setting up a new instance of SQL Server, do you do any kind of load testing? And what kinds of tools or methods do you use for this? <laughs> Eric is in the midst of it just finished writing a white paper for Google about this. So what's your uh, white paper? What's the methods in there? Goodness. So the stuff that I really like to do is, you know, before you, before you even install SQL Server, you want to get something like Crystal Disk Mark or Disk Speed fired up and make sure that you're getting adequate disk throughput because if you're not, before SQL Server is on there, it's not going to get better after you install SQL. SQL doesn't do anything magically to your I.O. After that, I want to throw uh, something like CPU-Z on there and make sure that my, my CPU speeds are as advertised. I want to make sure that I don't have something like uh, balanced power mode or something else yanking them down, uh, something ugly like that. And then once you know, I validate my hardware works as is, then I'm going to move on and install SQL. I'm going to start uh, running backups, DBCC, CheckDB, maybe some index rebuilds just to really test server throughput. And then you know, uh, from there you can expand on to uh, you know, testing like actual query workload on there. But you, what you really want to make sure is that like the basic maintenance tasks that you run on a new server uh, run the same as they do on your old server. If you have a match on those, or you do better on the new server, then you're you're in good shape for the rest for going forward. Brian asks. He says, "My sysadmins tout their knowledge of PowerShell. I poked around with it." <laughs> There's your answer. I can stop reading there. I poked around with it, but as a DBA, I've never had a substantial need for it. In your opinions, how important is it for me to learn PowerShell from a looking forward career perspective? Well, we'll go in a row. So, Richie, uh, Richie, do you need to learn PowerShell for your career? F PowerShell. Eric, do you need to learn PowerShell for your career? What he said. And Tara, do you need to learn PowerShell for your career? No, however, <laughs> I have attended a PowerShell cl class at one, one of my companies, and my last job did use PowerShell quite a bit. That The DBAs um, you know, wrote um, you know, scripts to do various things to help us um, do some tasks that we had to do, um, let's say quarterly. Um, the PowerShell script helped us do those tasks much more efficiently. Yeah, PowerShell has to... some neat stuff where you know you can spread out to kind of multiple servers and do things, and it has some like you know all, all right uh, integration with like you know Active Directory and failover clustering where you know there are some cool commands that you can you can run and do things with, but. Generally, for the things that I see most people applying PowerShell to, it's like there is already a good enough hammer for that. And I, I think that maybe PowerShell would be useful for larger corporations that have a lot of SQL servers, and you need to you know, loop through those servers to do the same repetitive task across all of them. But you know, one of the problems there's there an too. opening for Oracle PL SQL Report Writer. Maybe I'd rather be doing that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like when I when I had to use PowerShell, like when I tried to use PowerShell across an enterprise, it, I I got screwed so many times by just like there's different versions of PowerShell on some machines. Oh. PowerShell isn't set up to be remotely accessed on some machines. You always had to do this annoying check to, uh, to make sure you could actually execute a remote script or something. It was just the whole thing was like, yeah. By the time I finished, <laughs> I, like, I kind of just done. <laughs> uh, yeah, I got I got a few things about PowerShell. I actually had to write some. What was that? A week ago? A couple weeks mm -hmm. ago? I don't know. And mm -hmm. the, the the problem is is that there's the documentation isn't that great, right? Um, compared to things like C sharp and some other stuff, it's really hard to get in there. Okay, how do I do X or how does this thing work? It's, it's not that intuitive. The other thing is if I wanted to do X, which way to do that? And the the blogging community, there's like 15 different ways to do that. And there's not one generically, hey, this is the right way to do it. It's always the next version is the right way to do it, but you don't know, like Eric said, which version is on which machine, so things get all out of whack. It gets all at hand. The other thing is the PowerShell community, I lump them in with the Apple and the CrossFitters. <laughs> They're just... And vegetarians. Always, vegetarians. Yeah, and, and, yeah, vegans, really, not vegetarians, at least... I could get along with them. Hey, let's have some fish. But the 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 problem is is that the, everything is PowerShell. There, it's never, hey, can we try another technology? And maybe do it better. No, the answer is always PowerShell. I'm 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 Thor PowerShell wielding the PowerShell hammer, and I'm going to beat you into a submission. So, 
I, I'm a multi tool set guy. I like to use a lot of different technologies depending on what I'm using. Uh, just the other day, I was using uh, DynamoDB and Postgres. I work for a SQL Server company, people. Seriously. So I, I just don't get the one tool fits all thing. Doesn't I wrote some PowerShell to run the SQL query. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> all right. I have this thought, and I'll keep beating the dead horse. I'm really motivated by retirement. Like, I want to cross the finish line to retirement so I can go drink and do whatever it is retired people do, just vegetate on a beach. If something will make my salary go up, I'm interested. You know, I'm vaguely aware. If something won't propel my salary upward, I'm kind of like, eh, yeah, it's cool, but there's so many things I'd rather learn. I want to learn Spanish and French, and, you know, there's all kinds of things. Or how to make bread. <laughs> Oracle, yeah, Postgres, <laughs> DynamoDB, all, all kinds of stuff. You know, so I'm kind of like, is Postgres or is, a, is a PowerShell going to make me more money? It, it's a good scripting language, I guess, but if I'm going to learn a programming language at this time, it's going to be C Sharp. It's going to be something that I can reuse across a wide variety of stuff. I didn't say JavaScript. JavaScript. No. <laughs> VBA. That's, that ranks up there with with SAP. I get that you make a boatload of money doing it, but it is hard. It is. So he's motivated by retirement, and yet he still employs me, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not quite <laughs> sure I understand. You're inspiring. I mean, it's being around you is so calming and soothing because nothing gets worked on. I'm, it's almost Hi, like I'm, I'm retired Rupp. already. Have you met me at all? <laughs> oh, good. Uh, Graham says, I've been looking at job postings for senior DBAs, and I see a lot of data warehousing and ETL experience required. I've also seen a job that asks for eight-plus years of experience with SQL Server 2012. Are these job postings from people who want the flavor of the month, or are ETL and data warehouse work really becoming the purview of DBAs? I just see those and go next. You know, I just look right over them. I don't give them any any attention whatsoever. You're, Wait a minute. Probably... Why are you looking at job ads at all? <laughs> Whoa! Whoa. Uh, uh, I do have recruiters office. coming through LinkedIn all the time, and I I, I find it entertaining for, for the most part. To, you know, I, I've always looked at the recruiter emails over the years, and I'm you know, very happy at the time. You know. With, with where I was, but you know, as far as the eight years of experience with SQL Server 2012, they just mean SQL Server, and you know, they want you to have experience with 2012. But the ETL data warehousing, the, the company is just looking for a jack of all trades. They want to pay for one person and not two. So this is just a money thing. Right. You know, if you don't have that experience and you don't have any interest, just don't apply for it. I wouldn't be applying for that job, that's for sure. The other thing to keep in mind is that the people who write job postings are either HR people who have no idea what they're asking for, or they're tech people who are supremely pantsless when it comes to what they need for SQL Server, and so they will just throw whatever crap out there they think might be necessary. They'll just like hit, they'll just like open up the installer and be like, yeah, we need database engine, we need R, we need SSIS, SSRS, we need data quality. Yeah, data quality sounds good. They'll just throw anything in there and years of experience. We need AG, performance tuning, backup, or so. Ugh. I, I think there's a mentality to to cast the net wide, so I can theoretically get more more candidates, and then hopefully I'll get the one I want in that wide net. And typically, that usually doesn't work well for, especially guys like me. I'm like, eh, no, because because I, I see the same thing that, that Tara does is that you want jack of all trades, and that's not me. And so, have a nice day. They're writing that position to replace somebody who is stressed out and left, too. You know, the, <laughs> it was the one person, the one DBA, who had to put together 15 things with duct tape. And he's like, I'm so scared. I'm tired of this working with this. i got to get out of here. And then they're like, well, okay, we got to hire somebody to replace him, and not thinking that there's a reason that guy left. Let's see. Tim asks, can CheckDB be blocked? I was running it on a secondary in my availability group, and it took nine plus hours. But when I restored it somewhere else, it only took an hour. I would look at the the, um, the load on the on the original server. You know, CheckDB is a very very I/O intensive resource um, process, and you know if, if you're running it. Um, when other loads are occurring, it's going to slow it down. You know, even if it's off hours, a lot of people have a um, lot, you know, a lot of maintenance type stuff that has to occur at night, and your test server probably doesn't have any load. I, I, I'm surprised that a test server would complete in an hour when it's nine hours in production, because usually a test server has much lesser hardware, oh, and it yeah. you know, could take a while. Slower storage. You know, one one thing that uh that that Brent wisely has brought up in the past is, uh, when DBAs set up their jobs, <laughs> they set them all up on every server to run at the same time. 
So it's always That's like, true. oh, your backups yeah. start at midnight. Your check yeah. DBL starts at 2 in the morning. It's like your index bills all start at 4 in the morning. So that sand at every, like, mm-hmm. two hours just gets a new set of maintenance tasks. Just yeah. Man, and just right to the uh, Our sand admins always knew when check DB was running just based upon the IL load. <laughs> <laughs> Because you're like, it's, well, it's, it's all different servers. You know, how bad could it be? Not knowing that they all have something in common. Yeah. Called the host bus adapter. Tim might have seen the strangest thing that I've seen in a while. He says, I've seen a job listing that mentions that they want a candidate to be in the 90th percentile of ACT and SAT testing. <laughs> for their <DBA. laughs> I, We want somebody young. <laughs> I've never even took them. I, I, I had no plans on going to a four-year college right out of high school. I was going to go to junior college. That was always a plan to save money, and it's not required to go to junior college. So, yeah, they would not be able to hire me with that. <laughs> God, I did die. Yeah, I, I never took the SATs. I was uh, top 1% of top 1%. I was national merit finalist, got full rides anywhere I wanted to go. And I just wanted to go as far south as I could. I went to Houston just so I could get away from the snow. I'm like, this place is amazing. There's Mexican food and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> Houston is far from amazing, Brent. Oh, it's fantastic. To oh, live it's there. terrible. <laughs> I was in 24 hours with you, and I'm like, get me out of here. <laughs> it's probably easier. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, more more cool for And at the time, I was a Cure fan. I had long dyed black hair, you know, all kinds of. It was, I was an unusual time of my life. So Texas was the place for you. It was, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I continuously got pulled over. I had a Camaro, like an IROC Z kind of Camaro with T tops and uh, like black uh, louvers and all that over my windows. I was continuously getting pulled over because they thought I was trafficking weed back and forth between Michigan and Texas when I would go up to see my family or whatever. So I, I fit some kind of stereotype. I just don't know what uh, what it was at the time. It wasn't a stereotype here in Miami. I'm sorry, Brent. But... Oh yeah, yeah. You would be pulled well, over too, just because you were weird. But yeah, although I well yeah, I, you see, then immediately makes me want to go down to well, but I wasn't a European guy coming over to Miami wearing a thong, you know. But we welcome uh, them with open arms because they have money. They Please do have come. a lot of money. Yes. <laughs> you you hoping your arms kind of outstretched though, like you're looking for a hug. I don't know that you want that with the big uh, European guys in speedos. How much will I get for this hug? <laughs> the good thing is they're covered in so much oil, they're easy to squirm away from. Just... <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's gross. Oh. Oh, you pure speak of retirement, Brent. That is my retirement goal. And I have to hit 300 pounds, so I fit in my Speedo. That is my retirement. <laughs> oh, God. Wow, wow, so I'm disgusted right now. <laughs> <laughs> Our next company retreat is going to be somewhere that requires Orcas and fur coats. Now Tara's really looking at those job postings. She's like, oh, <laughs> I'm in a down jacket today, you know, and I've been back the past two weeks probably. And it's, I live in San Diego and I still have to wear a down jacket. So I'm just going to freeze on, um, in August for the retreat. <laughs> yes, and um, I, like some of our clients, am not wearing pants. <laughs> <laughs> many, many of our clients. Last question we'll take, uh, Chris says, and this is so interesting, Chris says, I'm a database developer looking to move into a more traditional DBA role, but I'm not quite sure what I would do on a daily basis. What does a typical D, uh, day for a DBA look like? So we'll work across and go from, in your say your last job, Tara, as a production DBA, or as a DBA period, just whatever DBA mm-hmm. means to folks, what did your typical day look like? I was usually working on project work, so I had things assigned to me to go do. And you know, sometimes I would be doing performance um, tuning of production stuff that wasn't, um, you know, running very well. Trying to see why you know it suddenly went from good performance to bad performance. You know, bad execution plans, things like that. Looking over who is active data. But usually, I was just assigned tasks. And then, you know, as an on-call DBA, when I was on call, I'd have to, you know. Be checking all the alerts and you know, resolving whatever issues those were. Uh, but last job was you know a bit different. I'd, I'd say at other jobs, so you know performance tuning was a, a great deal of my time. And unfortunately, troubleshooting rep replication was a uh, a you know a sizable percentage at times. So that was an unfortunate. But you know working on emergencies constantly. Um, you know just production type problems, uh, no, not production type, but production outage type problems where maybe it wasn't a server down, but you know a significant blocking issue that you know, the application seemed like it was down. So fighting fires a lot of times. Eric, how about you? 
Well, uh, you know, the thing uh, I think my last job was, of course, a, I was a DBA to relativity shop, which changes things, I think, a little bit from uh, sort of traditional DBA roles where, you know, I'm, you're just full time supporting a third party application. So you're maybe not doing, you know, query tuning as much. You are doing sort of server and hardware tuning and coming up with plans and maybe separate uh, heavy use uh, cases out to other servers. And you know, sort of stuff like that. You know, you you will do like index tuning because it, uh, Kcur is awesome about you adding indexes. They just say go crazy, whatever fits your workload, kind of. Uh, the, the if it fits your macros approach to indexing, which is nice, so you can have control of that. Uh, but uh, you know, on, on top of that, you know, Tara is different from uh, me because she was always part of big DBA teams. When I was a DBA, I was by myself. So whenever there was an outage, whenever there was a restore that needed to get done, whenever something broke, it was just me, me constantly. So that's why. Uh, so it it it, it kind of depends on what sort of environment you end up in, the sort of uh, breadth and girth of the things that you'll be exposed to and end up doing in the day. Chris, I'm gonna talk to you. Just just you. <laughs> I have my coworkers, but they lie. <laughs> what you do when you walk in, you see. Did my did my backups run? Mm -hmm. Then you figure out I need to schedule my backups. Then you run your backups. Then you leave. Then you go and do it all again. <laughs> that is a DBA. You don't want to do that, man. You want to continue where you're at. If you're if you're a database developer now, learn more about SQL. Learn more about the internals and how it works, how to perform it. Do that, and then get more into the development side. Get more into JavaScript, C sharp, those type of things. Get more project work because when you're on a project, you don't have a pager. You do not want a pager. Don't do that. All right, man. Don't throw your life away, man. You are too good. I love you, man. I am. I'm talking to you. You're the best. You're the fairest. See, see what I did there? You're the awesome. Don't do this to yourself, man. You have too much to live for. I agree with Richie. Uh -huh. If you like database development, you know, if if it's something that you're enjoying and having a good time with, because it is a fun career. I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff around being a data developer, but. Um, I was intoxicated by the, I wanted to be in the middle of the room. You know, we would have a bunch of sysadmins and network people and developers and executives and, you know, there's a, an addictive thing to being the guy who troubleshoots the problems, but the flip side of that is you are the guy who troubleshoots the problems. And it's the on-call, when I finally switched to going to consulting and I didn't go on-call, was probably the best, like, month of my life when I realized <laughs> that I'm like... I can leave the phone over there. You know. <laughs> being, being the guy that troubleshoots everything, that's how I was two jobs ago. And even when I wasn't on call, I really was on call still. Just I was mm -hmm. always I always had to be the one that they called even when I wasn't on call. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be in the room where it happens. It's it's all a facade. <laughs> don't you don't want to do that. Don't be in the room where it happens. Just let them do it. Just and it's it's so code. different at different times of your career. The first three or four years of your career suck to be the one who's in the center of the room. It's that you have to gain enough experience where you're comfortable and go, no, I can step in front of that train and I know exactly how to get this thing to work. But yeah, the first few years are rough. And just when you think you know what you're doing, then all of a sudden some consultant comes in and finds out you don't have backups and your auto shrink is on and you know, you know wearing that <laughs> his pants. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us this week, and we will see you guys next week on Office Hours. Adios. Later. Later.